Hello my lovelies. This is the second part of the how to be an audiobook narrator um, recordings that I wanted to do. Um, and this is the, the last one, so yeah. Sorry it's taken so long. I've been really busy. <laughs> so what I wanted to talk about today is um, what I consider to be the most important skill that you need as an audiobook narrator. I'm suddenly horribly aware that I have not warmed my voice up adequately, but never mind. When people think about audiobook narration, um, they might think about the different accents you need to do for um, dialogue, what kind of voice you've got. And these things are important. Being able to do lots of different accents is so helpful. Being able to do lots of different types of voices as well is helpful. But for me, I think the most important skill is being able to sight read. And by sight read, what I mean is the ability to read text at a normal narrative pace with, while making as few mistakes as possible. And the only way that I think you can really do that is if you're able to read slightly ahead with your eyes so that you um, have the right tone of voice, so that you speak the right character voice, but also uh, just so that you deliver the line correctly, because it's sometimes the the next sentence that actually impacts how the sentence you're reading at the moment needs to be delivered. I don't know if I'm explaining that very well, so I thought it might be a good idea to give you an example of what that actually is. And that's because, I'm just putting my notes down, and that's because um, the thing about sight reading and why it's important is that it will impact the profitability of the audiobook recording process. And that sounds horrible. If you make lots of mistakes and you are working with a studio, it costs extra time it costs your time because you get paid per finished hour. So if you make lots and lots and lots of mistakes, you're going to be in the studio recording for more hours. You won't get paid for working that extra amount of time. The studio itself will also have to employ a producer, um, the director, whether that's two people or one person, usually one person. Um, and so it's their time as well. If there is a hire situation, that's how much time the studio is hired out for, or rather how long a project takes, and therefore they can't do any other books whilst your book is being done. It also takes more time if there are lots of mistakes to edit out at the editing phase, and potentially there may be more pickups that need to be done. So it's actually really important as a skill and is something that I don't see people talking about a lot when they talk about narration. So I'm going to demonstrate it to you. The reason why I think it is a skill rather than something that you um, can prepare for, obviously you can, you can practice and acquire that skill, but what I mean is when you prepare an audiobook, you can't learn the whole book. That would be crazy. Books are 80 to 100,000 plus words long. You can't remember the sequence that they come in. So even though you've prepared the book and you've got notes and you may have notes on what is going to happen in that chapter, who the characters are, what voices they have, which accents they have. When it comes to actually just delivering the book, you're going to have to rely on sight reading to give as clean a read as you can. And so what I've got here is one of my own books, because obviously I give myself permission to read my own stuff on my own YouTube channel. If I was reading somebody else's book, I'd have to pick one that was way out of copyright. But this is written by me and I did the um, audiobook. And I'm only going to read a little chunk just to demonstrate what sight reading is like. I am going to flick to a random page. Now, I don't have my notes from when I recorded this book. I actually can't find them, which was really annoying when it came to recording the short story collection. Um, but anyway, um, 
so I may get some of the voices wrong, but when I'm in the booth, I've obviously done the prep and I've got all of my notes there on which voice is which. And, and so, yes, these voices may be incorrect. But what I'm going to show you is the, um, the flow, the flow when you're reading. Um, it's really hard to describe this. So I'm going to flick to any page just to demonstrate that this isn't a page that I've practiced lots. I haven't actually looked inside this book since, I think, since I was writing the short story collection, um, short stories. So I haven't looked inside this book for a year or two. Um, and I'm not cheating, basically. That's what I'm saying. So I'm going to flick to any page, open it up. So I'm going to flick through to a random page. I've already done this once, but I flicked to a page later in the book, which was a spoiler. So I'm going to flick in the opposite direction. So I'm more likely to end up early in the book where there's less chance of spoilers. Good grief. Right. Lying on the bed, I open the message from Charlie and have it played on the screen. His face looms out, huge from where the Martian landscape was just moments before. He looks tired. Hi, he says into the camera, running a hand through his hair. It's longer than he normally wears it. I suppose I'm not there to remind him to get it cut. So I guess you'll either be just about to land or just arrived. I'm hoping to get a confirmation that all is well any minute now, and it's making me worry, so I thought I'd message you. It's just after three in the morning. Mia was up earlier and I just couldn't get back to sleep. Your mum says hello, by the way. I keep telling her she can send you messages, but she said that every time she tries, she starts crying, so... He shrugs. It's like you died or something. Maybe you should send her a message, just to tell her you aren't dead? She doesn't seem to believe me. What else? Well, work is stupid at the moment, with all the capsule bollocks going on. It takes me a moment to remember what he's talking about, as I stopped reading the news feeds about halfway through the journey. The capsule was one of the reasons I stopped, as the endless speculation about what was inside was getting boring. I think that's probably long enough. So what I'm aware of when I'm reading is that I'm actually reading a sentence ahead and gearing up for how to say that whilst I'm still saying the, the sentence I'm reading out. That's not something I became consciously aware of until I started recording in a studio and suddenly was aware of um, not the pressure to make as few mistakes as possible, but realising just how important that was. It is something that I think comes and improves with practice. And it would be very easy for you to work out whether you need to work on that a lot because you can just sit down, record from a book, stop recording, listen back and look at um, how many mistakes you made and also whether the pace was OK, whether the hesitations came in when you were trying to figure out how it was supposed to sound in the next bit. I hope this makes sense. Anyway, what I'm saying is it's important because if you don't have this skill, or if you need to practice it a lot more, it's unlikely that you'll be invited back to record more books with a studio, because they will lose a lot of money if you make mistake after mistake after mistake. Obviously, we all make mistakes, and sometimes it'll be picked up um, by your producer in the moment, or your director, and you immediately restart that line and correct it in the session and that'll be taken out in an edit. Sometimes both of you miss the mistake that's been made and that's something that's dealt with in pickups. But generally, if I read for an hour, there's usually 50 to 55 minutes of usable stuff in that. I don't make many mistakes and um, it's definitely a good thing for everybody involved is to really keep your mistake rate down. Another skill that I think is useful to acquire, not critical, but definitely if you're planning to work from home, because there are a lot of people now who narrate from home, they have a booth set up. You can't see it 
from this angle, but I actually have loads of acoustic foam all around me to, to try and make this space as uh, acoustically dead as I can so that it doesn't sound echoey. Um, but let's say that you have um, a home studio set up. It's also possible, depending on the type of gig that you get, that you also need to edit because there are some um, audiobook companies. Um, I don't know if this is the case with ACX, whether you um, edit your stuff as well. I'm not sure because I haven't done any narration through ACX, which is the um, narrator side of Audible. Uh, even if you're going to go and work in a studio for the vast majority of your projects, I still think it's really useful to learn how to edit audio and the re and specifically to edit your own audio because you need to get used to hearing your own voice especially if you're recording at home you may not have a setup which is like in the studio where you hear your voice as you're speaking um so you need to get used to how your voice sounds you need to learn how your voice sounds when it's warmed up or not warmed up and how it feels but also it gives you an understanding of the mistakes that you commonly make with pronunciation and also helps you to improve your narrative style as well. Um, with editing, I think one of the benefits it gave me in particular was um, hearing some elements in my voice where little bits of my accent came out. Um, I have a really bizarre accent because I was born and grew up in Cornwall, but also spent quite a lot of time in my childhood up in Lancashire. And my dad is from Lancashire, so I have some of that accent, uh, some Cornish. And then it was kind of neutralised by moving around lots, living all over the country. So I have what is generally called a neutral English accent. Um, but there is still little elements that if I'm not careful uh, can creep in. So if you edit your own audio, you can hear that and it stops you from doing it in the future. Moving on to how you get work. So I work with a studio and we've worked together for many, 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 many years. It's great. I will um, get emails from them saying, would you like to audition for a particular project because you kind of meet the criteria and I will do an audition and will either get it or not. Sometimes I will just be picked for a project. Um, the audiobook I just recorded last week um, was just assigned to me because they were like, nope, your voice is absolutely the one we want. Sometimes I have authors request me specifically because they've either heard me read books that are in the same genre as the ones that they're going for and they like my voice um, or because they feel that I would just do a job, good job for theirs. I, I don't know. They, they, or they like my work. Um, if you're an author watching this, um, that is always something that can be borne in mind when the discussion begins if you've got a book deal um, regarding the audiobook, you can make a request for particular audiobook narrators and it's relatively easy to do, especially if they're a professional narrator. If it's like, oh, well, my next door neighbour's got a lovely voice and I'd like him to do it, that would be probably less easy to make happen. But if you have listened to audiobooks and you've particularly enjoyed a narrator, you can always mention that to your publisher um, or the company that is responsible for doing the audiobook. Sometimes they outsource to different um, audio companies and you can say, I would really love that narrator. And if at all possible, they will get that person in because that's how I've actually got quite a bit of work. Starting the relationship with the studio is actually relatively easy. You don't need an agent as an audiobook narrator. I don't know anybody who does audiobook narration in the UK that has an agent. And the studio that I work with has never mentioned 
agents. So I think just in this industry, it's just not something that's evolved. Um, with a studio, if you've not narrated anything before, you need to give them a sample. So let's imagine you've you've done loads of practice at home. You want to go into this. You want to work with the studio because the benefits of the working with the studio is that you don't have to edit the material yourself and they will have a booth set up. You don't need to invest in a home set up. You can just go there and do the work. The um, the thing to do when you're at that point where you're ready to begin that is to record a, a voice demo effectively to record a sample of your narration um, and if you have accents that you can do for characters to do samples of those um, I would recommend just finding a book where you can showcase that um, and I would send it to the studio that you have in mind because you're going to want to approach ones that are nearby to you geographically for obvious reasons if there aren't any nearby to you, then pick somewhere that you have places you can easily stay at because it will get expensive. Like I, I don't narrate in London studios because it's so expensive to get to London and to stay over for a multiple day project that would actually, I would probably be out of pocket by the end of that. So yeah, find somewhere that you can either get to easily in a commute or where you know somebody that you can stay with nearby and approach the studio, say that you would like to be considered as a narrator, send them the demo um, and see how you go. That's not how I started my relationship with the studio I work with. It was actually that I had already narrated several audiobooks for a Canadian audiobook company that I had recorded and edited at home. And then I got my first proper book deal um, for the Split World series and asked if I could narrate them and explained that I'd narrated, I think I'd only narrated like six or seven books by that point and they asked for me to audition and I did and got the gig but they actually found the studio, it was a studio that was close to where I lived at the time in Somerset so they made that connection and the job was already set up and it was great. I learned a lot on that first book because that was the first time I'd worked in a studio setting. Um, that's another thing actually that I wanted to mention is stamina. You need to acquire stamina to record in a studio setting. I usually record for about an hour and then have a 10 minute break and then back in for another hour, 10 minute break. So you need to be able to narrate for at least an hour without needing to take a break. When you record in a home booth, you know, you may have a different schedule that you follow. Before that first book that I did in a studio, I used to only record for 20, 25 minutes and then I'd have to stop because I hadn't, I was still learning the skill and I still hadn't built up that stamina. Uh, so yeah, then hopefully the, the studio will say, great, thank you, we'll put you on our books and they will obviously categorize what kinds of books it would be suitable for because books are commissioned on the basis of gender and um, kind of like primary accent and age. Age is a little bit more fluid um, because obviously people can act younger and older voices but sometimes there are books that require voices that sound more mature or more young than others. So yeah there are criteria that will narrow down a short list of narrators and then you wait to see if there are any auditions. So you don't have to worry about an agent as I said, you can literally just do that. I think it would be really really wise if you are a complete beginner though that before you approach a studio you record an entire audiobook and learn what it's like and understand how hard it is and I'm not just talking about doing an hour every evening for a few weeks. Set yourself two days and say, OK, I'm going to narrate six hours of material each day, because that will give you a really good idea of what it is like in a studio setting. And it's good for you to be able to know that you can handle that and what you need to do to be able to handle that. You know, what is best to do on a break? What drinks? Do you need to avoid? 
you know, coffee isn't a great thing to drink before narration because it tends to make you a little bit croaky. Um, all of those things, is, it's just good to know before you get into a studio setting. And also, if you can say when you apply to the studio, I've narrated an entire book and you can find it here, that will help. But obviously, you can't just pick your favourite book and record an entire book and put it up online somewhere for somebody to find to consider you for audition, because that would be a breach of copyright, unless it's a really old book. So as long as the book is back in the public domain, so like the Sherlock Holmes novels, Sherlock Holmes novels um, is a really good example of that. That's in the public public domain. So any books like that, um, you can record and not breach any copyright. One project um, that I'm aware of, I've never done it. Um, I think it's called LibriVox, and the idea is that it's a voluntary um, project where people record audiobook versions of books that are in the public domain. And this is for accessibility and just because it's a nice thing to do. So you could always look into LibriVox and get your experience of narrating a book in entirety and the amount of work that that takes and how difficult it can be on a project which will also benefit other people. I had no idea it existed until well into my audiobook narration journey, so that's not where I started. Uh, if you want to record as an independent narrator, i.e. not as part of a studio, you can do that. Like I said, you may end up having to edit all of the audio as well. It's a huge amount of work. Don't underestimate how long it takes. If I have to edit stuff, usually I allow the length of the file plus 50% as the amount of time that it will take to edit it properly. But then again, that's podcasts, which are much more chatty and bitty and so, yeah, you have to build in not just the time to prepare the book and narrate it, but also to edit it. So, you know, look carefully at that. I don't know if all gigs um, require you to edit. That's for you to find out. So ACX is one that I've mentioned so far. That's a marketplace, effectively, where you can um, advertise yourself as a narrator for hire. I think you have to put down like the, the categories that your voice falls into and your per finished hour rate. And that I think that's in a range. So people who are looking for narrators, if they're on a really tight budget, they may be looking for narrators that have a much lower per finished hour rate. Um, and obviously they will be using the, the information you give about what your voice is, um, you know, what categories your voice falls into to be able to shortlist narrators to ask to do an audition. I think there are also auditions that are posted up and you can just audition for them. Again, I have not used this service. Please do your own research. There are lots and lots of places online, YouTube um, videos about all of this. You, you can go and find it out. Um, I have a feeling that Find Away Voices may have been in the process of setting something like this up, but I'm not so sure. They've been bought by Spotify. Things seem to be getting a bit clunky with Find A Way, so I'm hmm, not sure. Not sure what's happening there. Um, I think that is everything. Sorry, I'm looking down. I'm looking down at my notes. If you want to record at home, you do need to invest in making a space which is as acoustically dead as possible. Um, the acoustic foam panels that I'm looking at that you can't see right now, they're actually a recycled memory foam mattress um, that happened to have um, lots of lines cut into the foam to make the top flexible. And I just snipped off the corners so that it looks like that um, acoustic foam that you can get. Facebook Marketplace is a good place to look. Sometimes people sell um, acoustic foam uh, tiles that you can go and pick up much cheaper. It's very expensive. There are ways to get around it. Um, things you can make, again, search on YouTube. Uh, but 
it's really important to make sure that you don't have other noises. If you live next to a main road, it's going to be very difficult for you to record a really good copy at home. Um, if you have a condenser mic, like this one is a condenser mic, you are not going to pick up as much from your environment, but having really good background as close to silence as you can is important. So it may just be that where you live um, isn't suitable for you to do a, an audiobook at home. I don't have a recording booth at home. Um, and this is set up for recording um, for YouTube. So if I was going to record an audiobook, I would probably reorganize all of this again so that all of the acoustic foam was much, much closer. Um, and it would be impossible because this is my living room and I would not be able to use my living room for the length of the project. That's why I like using a studio. Uh, I don't think there's anything else that I wanted to say. I hope I explained sight reading well enough. Uh, if there's anything that I haven't covered that you have any questions about, pop them in the comments below and I will try to take less than a whole damn year to answer them. Ugh. I, I am very, very busy and um, apologies for taking a long time to release these things. I hope it's helpful. Audiobook narration is really, really enjoyable. It's really rewarding. It's such an absorbing activity. It, it really is like climbing inside a book. It's hard work, though. And by that, I mean it's tiring. You have to really concentrate and perform for hours and hours and hours and hours in a recording day and that just just mashes your brain but if it's something that you're interested in do it have a go nobody's nobody's going to stop you uh if you're concerned about whether your voice would be suitable or not record it record a little snippet of you talking and and send it to people and say would you like to listen to me reading a whole book um the only reason I even considered audiobook narration was because I was recording a chapter of a book I was trying to get published, um, which is up above me. Um, I was recording a chapter of that at a time before I found a publisher. That is a whole long story and the book never should have been published because it's not very good. But anyway, when I wasn't getting anywhere with it, I was releasing a chapter a, a week in audio because I didn't want to publish the text online. This was back in, oh, I don't know, 2009, 2008, I can't remember. Um, and people were saying how nice my voice was to listen to when I should be an audiobook narrator. I never would have considered it before that point. Um, the only other thing I would say is that if you're thinking, oh, but I can't do lots of different voices and I can't do lots of accents, don't worry. There's actually a lot of help out there for, um, not just like accent pronunciation, because there are things on YouTube for that, but there is also YouTube. So you can spend time whenever I'm watching random channels if the person in the video has a particularly strong accent i will file it into my own private playlist of accents and then if there is a particular accent i need for a book and i think oh i think i've got that in my accents folder i can just go and listen to that again and again and again and again um and there are like how-to videos on how to do accents but also there's a there's a really really good video i'll pop a link to it in the description below where somebody gives you a way to do lots and lots of different voices just by minor adjustments to how you speak. It's kind of like a performance difference rather than um, a particular accent. So it's like mod modulating the pitch of your voice or how breathy it is. or um, And of course, how you act the character is also going to impact how different the characters are from each other. Um, you will have to do regional accents at some point. That, that's just the way it is. I can't imagine. There are very, very few books I've done where that hasn't been the case. And so if that's something you really struggle with, you can just build in time to acquire that accent and practice. Uh, yeah, I think that's everything. I hope that this was helpful. Um, again, like I said, if there's anything else you want to know, let me know in the comments. Uh, if you want to listen to me narrate books, those are my books up there. 
Uh, there isn't an audio one of 20 years later. There shouldn't be. It's not very good. But the Split World series I narrated and all of the Planetfall novels apart from After Atlas, because that's a male POV and that just wouldn't have sounded right. Um, but I've narrated lots of other audiobooks. Um, one that I particularly loved was Ogres by Adrian Tchaikovsky. Uh, available anywhere that you can get audiobooks. It is, it's a novella. It was so enjoyable to narrate. One of my favourite narration gigs. If you want a long form uh, thing to listen to, super long book, uh, Adrian's Guns of the Dawn, I also narrated. That's a very long book. I really enjoyed that. That was lovely to read. Uh, and I've narrated books in all kinds of genres, historical romances, really gritty crime, thrillers, serial, serial killer novels, all kinds of things. So you can just search for my name if you're curious about how I sound when I'm at work. I hope that helps. Bye!